Hi, today I'm discussing a topic that should be of interest to every entry level civil engineer who is aspiring to be a structural engineer. This is something you should be practicing from the beginning of your career. This is about the load takedown. The load calculations that you do has to be precise. This has much higher significance than what you think. I will break this down to simple steps for your understanding. Hi all, this is Premjit here from CivilEra.com. Every client or an architect looks at a civil and structural engineer skill with a few yardsticks. So these are three important things that you need to be focusing on and they are economy of the structural design, the structural engineer's communication. So that's the drawing that is also going to be looked upon the structural engineer's ability to handle revisions and site mistakes and issues. But currently I will be focusing on the economy of the design in the structural video. As I already mentioned, the accuracy of the load calculation has an important role in deciding the economy. Mind you, you also have to stick to the code, adhere to the code without any compromise. You will have to achieve this economy and that's what I'm going to be precisely telling you the load takedown and its significance. Let me quickly tell you what the dead loads that we actually compute in a building project. So it includes self-weight of the members, self-weight of finishes like scree, tiles, weight of walls and so on. Now let me discuss how we generally calculate these and how a wrong assumption or consideration can compound the load takedown and then spoil your economy. You know that generally slab contribute most of the dead weight of structural members. So considering that during the preliminary sizing, we got a thickness of around say 125. Sometimes you get 100 also if your slab span is very less. But then keeping in a lot of things like the electrical conduits and all that running through the slab, many times you increase your thickness rather than asking the electrical engineer to be more precise. So all these are compounding your problem. So you have to be very specific in deciding all this. Many times young engineers also think that more thickness is safer. That's not really right. So mind you that if you are increasing the thickness from 100 to 125 or from 125 to 150, you are increasing the dead weight. Now the challenges with finishes, scree, tiles and fall ceilings are even more. Many times the architect and the client would not have frozen the thickness of the tile or the kind of the tile and therefore we may not be even knowing the scree thickness and the self weight of that. So we are considering these loads based on our understanding of the project and it can be too high and compounding if you are considering it without a logical understanding of what the building might finally have. So it will be a good idea to communicate this with the architect and then get all this fixed as soon as possible before we freeze the final design. Same thing is with the false ceilings. We might not have an idea on what kind of false ceilings the client prefers is it going to be a less weight one or a bit heavier one so we might be forced to factor in there and then consider a little large load here but mind you again that even 100 millimeter difference or 50 millimeter difference can have a compounding effect i'm going to explain you that so please see the video till the end I also encourage you to visit www.civilara.com slash blog and read this blog as well because I am touching upon in the video but there might be a few additional things in the blog which might be an added advantage for you to understand. And I also want to point out that many times wall thickness is also changed or conservatively considered. 100 millimeter walls are considered 200 millimeter thinking it may change later by the client and the beam need to take it with that revision. But it is compounding a problem to many faults. You are considering 200 millimeter walls on the 200 millimeter walls on many beams when the probability of that change is only on one beam. So this can have a compounding effect on not just the dead load, also on the seismic load. So I will come to that later. Also note that you can even factor in the large openings in walls to reduce the load. Many times you will have a situation where if this is your wall, you have a lot of large openings inside that. Say a window and a big door or something like that. So if you have these large openings, you can even factor in that opening 
in your dead load calculation thereby making it more economic and another point that i want to tell you is that if you want the wall to be added in all the beams and if you don't have the wall in the current design then don't do it on all the walls because it's going to be increasing your dead load for the seismic calculation and in reality it may be in one or two beams that that wall is going to come in so design these for gravity loads consider the wall load extra and design for the dead load live load combination but then when it comes to the seismic analysis and design please stick to the exact current design and don't bother about an additional later being added into the beams because it's not going to come in all the beams for sure so unnecessarily increasing the dead weight can increase your seismic demand same way sunken requirement for toilets many times the client might not have frozen what kind of toilet he needs and what kind of sunken is needed and the specification for the fill material also may not be there so if you are using cinder instead of brick bats then there might be a lot of load reduction and all these little things add up and then help you to reduce the amount of steel needed in the project same thing is about the live load is 875 part 2 gives you a conservative load and then 1893 allows you to reduce it to realistic values so i am cross linking to another blog that i have written in civil arab and I highly recommend you read that additional blog as well. So if you go to the blog which I am telling here, you will also be able to see the additional blog which will give you the idea on what live load reduction is all about and what 1893 and IS 875 part 2 talks about the live load reduction. It's very important that you understand that. And please also note that it's very important to communicate with architect and the client to understand the exact functional use of the building. I have had situations where client or the architect came to me saying that the building is a library and it ended out to be a reading room which had very less consideration for load required. If anyone has a confusion to understand all these what I'm explaining in the video you are free to come to the blog and then click the join link and join into my email list and my groups and then discuss about all this there. So I have given the link to that. Now, as all of you know, additional dead or live load is going to increase your sizes of footings, columns, beams, and even slabs. Of course, it depends on how much the load increase is. However, there is going to be an increase. Now, let me tell you an example for that. So assume that you have a building like this and after all your analysis, say you are grouping some of the beams. So I'm just putting in some columns and beams in place so that I can explain it in a more careful manner. So assume that one particular beam is having a moment of something like say 50 here and 50 here and you are required to design this for 50 kN meter moment. But consider that due to your additional load consideration could be sunken, could be something more on dead load could be something on fall ceiling whatever everything put together there was an increase and the increase moment was 57 now if you have not refined the dead load or live load you will not even come to know that this 50 has become 57 so that's where i'm telling you the importance or the significance of taking the right load so let me continue and then explain you what will happen now assume that this particular moment is in the n beam so here in this B1 you have that so I will change that and then assume that the other beams say these B2 and B2 will have something like say 62 I'm just taking some arbitrary value I'm not looking at logic at this point say 62 now what you will do is you will probably round this off to 65 and then say design it so the actual moment was 50 and it became 57 and for B2 now it is 62 and you rounded off to 65 and then also you thought like 62 and 57 are too close so let us group these beams so what you will do is you will end up designing all these beams for a moment of 65 whereas a few of them have only a moment of 50 and 50 would have given you a steel of around say 200 and 20 or something like that now 65 is going to give you something say 250 I'm just taking an arbitrary value now 
250 is more than 212 and you will end up giving an additional steel it could be 216 or it could be 212 plus 212 if it's a 200 millimeter wide beam so this is how it is getting compounded actual required was 220 and 212 would have been sufficient and the grouping as well as the additional moment that you took because of the additional load which you didn't know that is actually more you got a larger moment of 65 and that gave you something like 250 or even more it could be something like 280 or 300 even but then you don't have the opportunity to use 212 you will have to use it much more and 216 has an area of 400 and you actually need only 220 and you end up giving a larger steel if you are not careful about it so this is what i mean by compounding and as a beginner you have to be very careful about this otherwise you are ending up as a very uneconomic designer in your life so what you learn in your beginning of your career stays with you so be very sure about load takedown what i would advise you is to stick to correct load calculation and if you feel like you need some more margin in your design you apply that at the end when you detail you have a clear understanding you know that 212 is what you need so so what you do is in your final detail you know that everything is precise you know that load is correct you know the factor is correct everything is right and then say you want some margin due to some reason you think like yes the contractor is a little lazy guy or you are not getting enough time to check the detail at sight every time then what you do is you apply that correction at the last stage say you have 212 and you have 212 extra you are additionally providing upon your design now you have a full control and understanding on what you have done you know that this is what you have given extra but if you have let your load compound you have no control on this and you have no idea what is right and what is the extra steel that you are given in addition to what you really need so this is what matters and this is what gives you control on what you are doing now i also want to say an additional point that this exponential increase is going to be even more when you are considering seismic now what do you mean by seismic your own building's dead load and live load getting converted as a lateral load it's an inertial force earthquake is nothing but ground movement and earthquake force is nothing but the deflection due to the lateral movement or the induced forces due to the deflections and how is this happening this is because of the inertia due to the gravitational force your building is being constantly attracted to the center of the earth and when there is a sudden earthquake or a sudden earth movement the inertial force tries to prevent the building from movement and then it's subjected to an inertial force and that's what earthquake force is all about and if you consider more dead load or more live load in your analysis your earthquake demand is going to be higher you know that if the dead load is more or the live load is more than what is really needed if you have considered more of it then definitely your earthquake analysis is going to result in more forces and you have to attend to that and your design and the steel consumption will be much higher sometimes even your scheme will get affected you might need more shear walls you might need more column sizes you might need more number of columns and so on so it has an exponential rise in the earthquake demand and hence you should be very careful in doing your load takedown so i encourage youngsters to take correct loads initially and then if you need any margin due to some reason apply that at the end that's when you detail don't do it before that so that you have a better control on on what you are doing and finally as a summary i would like to say that load takedown in building project is very important it's not just right to be always conservative and assume things there is a huge difference in assumption and consideration i always tell that consideration has a basis and a logic whereas the assumption can be really wild you don't know what it is and you take something much higher than really needed especially in the beginning of your career you are likely to do that it's very important to engage with all stakeholders of the project like an architect 
you can even consider making layouts which explains the architect or the client that you are considering so much of load say for example if you explain things in kilonewton per meter square an architect or a client may not appreciate how much it is if somebody tells you that yes this is a building that you are going to have and it's an office building and if the wall layout is not provided then better sketch that for them and then say that maybe this is what i have considered this much variation is possible with the kind of load that i have considered say i have considered one kilonewton per meter square and this is what it can do if you give this as an idea to the client and the architect you are more likely to get a solution and freeze the load requirement so a client and an architect will have more feel if you explain it in this way than going by the values so it's all about encouraging the client and the architect and other stakeholders to take decisions in the right way without much conflict and with lesser coordination so you can try out all these good practices which will help you to become economic so if you adopt all the fine tuning in load calculations many times we can adhere to all structural code provisions i have heard many people saying that how can i meet this particular provision this 1893 is not justifiable it's giving me more steel so some of it can be adopted if you are really fine tuning your load and then going by what is really needed so let us make building design industry more correct more productive and more economical by bringing in all these practices so good luck to all youngsters here and see you in a different video next week watching thank you so much for watching see you soon in another blog and another video please ensure you like this video and subscribe if you have not and also join my groups in www.civilera.com